Shalom, this is Rabbi Mordecai Ben Avram here. Um, just um, really excited. We're moving forward in the Book of Shemos, and you know, for me, it's 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 about really connecting to that transition. You know, that transition between the 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 total place of revealment and trans and slowly progressing into a lower and lower dissemination of concealment, and being able to go through that process inside the Torah and being able to take that mechanism of, of thinking and apply it to my everyday life, you know, because at times there could be total revealment. And in other times, you know what, that, that revealment that was there conceals, but it doesn't mean that that original light is not there. It just means that there's a process of how that light is disseminated. So me learning the, the book of Shamos and learning the Torah in general, learning the book of Breshis, you know, they're taking me through these processes so I can apply it to everyday life and then I can heighten my experience, my, my connection to God, my connection to life, my connection to everything around me. So, you know, we, we talked about Moshe and we talk about the, the inception of Moshe and the Kavana that his father Amram and his, and his, and his, and his mother, uh, jo, um, Johevet, um you know, had with um, coming back together and manifesting Moshe as a child, you know, and, and bringing him, you know, in this world and bringing him in this world with the Kavana, bring the Geula and saving the Jewish people and saving lives and saving humanity and bringing God's light into this world for all of creation. And that was their Kavana. This Kavana allowed them to bring the Shekinah into their home. And the Shekinah is, is, was a partner in the conception of Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's why he came out with such a tremendous or That's why he had, uh, um, he came out with already with a brisk meal. He already came out in a spiritually perfected state. And he shows us the power of the, the Kavana that Moshe's parents had when they brought him him. And that built him, right? And that built him. But I want to fast forward that story to when Moshe's mother is in a predicament where she has to, to, to let him go, where she has to put him into the Nile River, where she has to create a, a teva for him in order for him to be safe, to be able to get to a particular place. And, and, and we, we have to understand like who his mother was. His mother was a woman who was fighting, going against the Paro and was bringing children in the world and is working as a, um, what do they call it? The, 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 the ladies who work with the pregnant, a doula, you know, she, she was working in that capacity. So she was all about saving lives. So this person, this woman is put in a position, the one who's been saving all these lives and saving all these children and going against the paro and all these different dynamics. Now this person is faced in a situation where they have to send their own child away. Right. And so it's really important to connect to that, that, that conflict, that conflict, that, that dynamic, because this is part of the greatness of people that have a moon. The people who have a moon and people who connect to Hashem, they don't sit back and say, hey, you know what? Look at all the good that I did. Look at all the people that I helped. Look at all the things that I've done in the world. And you know what? Now I put in a situation where I have to now put my child's life at risk, hoping that he survives, right? That, that dynamic, that has to be like a devastating thought when you're doing everything to connect to Hashem. And everything you're doing is to connect to God and to be loved by God and to be one with God. That's the whole point. And so now you did all this good. You saved all these lives. And now you're put in this situation. That person, through that process of giving, should have built their level of amuna where they understand that God put me in this possession, position because this is the best thing. I was told we were giving prophecy. My husband was giving prophecy that this child was going to be a light into the world, that this child was going to bring Mashiach. This child is Mashiach. This child was the redeemer that we've heard about since the times of Yosef. So that, that child is now. So now I'm being put in a situation to know, to, to put this child in danger. Ah, it's not danger. It's not danger. This is actually the path. 
This is uh, this crazy situation that's opened itself up. That's the path. And so a lot of times in life, people miss out on humongous opportunities because it doesn't fit the way that they think life should respond to them. Right. Sometimes people miss out on amazing opportunities and the people that they marry because the beginning was a certain way or this person had certain limitations or or they didn't fit their their shidduch resume or any of these different types of things. They didn't fit that. So they missed out because it, they didn't go deeper. They didn't go deeper. And the people of Amuna are the people who go deeper. Moshe's mother knew that her son was going to be safe knew that her son was going to be led on a path of angels and protection. And that path that he was going to lead to was going to ultimately lead for good for himself, for Am Israel and the whole world. She, she knew that because that was the basis of how the relationship started. So when we think about life and decisions, we have to really go inside because we may be presented with opportunities that our pride will not allow us to see. Our entitlement may block us out. So, so, so the, the, the Zohar says when, when, when Badia, when Pharaoh's daughter is coming out in the ocean is when the Jewish people were almost completely separated from their, their ways of the Torah as a collective, that there was, that there was a separation that was going against Am Israel. And at the same time as that was happening, Pharaoh's daughter entered the river. And they talk about the river being connected to judgment and the oceans and the seas being connected to mercy. And so the judgment of Am Israel was, 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 was coming into this world. And this was the hardest time of tyranny for the Jewish people. And, and this was the beginning of the Yeshua. This was the beginning of the redemption for all these people in this new beginning, this new reality in life. And so that's what we have to understand about this process of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, when you look at his life, and what we can gain from it, and what we can grow from this, Moshe Rabbeinu was all about transitions. He was all about transitions. He was in one phase of life, and he went to another phase of life. He went to another phase of life. He went to another phase of life. So the story is Moshe Rabbeinu grows up with the best education, right? Best education, and you got to realize the empire that Moshe Rabbeinu was in is the empire that grew because of his ancestor, Yosef, who was responsible for bringing all the wealth in the world and making, starting of the process of Egypt becoming a mega superpower so Egypt could be the host of, 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 of the exile for the Jewish people. And this exile, you, 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 the, 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 the Zohar asked the question, they asked the question, so why, what was the purpose of this exile? What was one of the purposes of exile? And there's many different sheets, there's different points on it. But the point is like this. It was through the difficulty. This is so important to hear this. It was through the difficulty and the rejection and even sometimes painful extreme painful experiences that the Jewish people went through was the molding dynamic as setting the stage for them to become a nation. It was through the process that the Egyptians saying, oh, well, you are a Hebrew, you are Israel, you are different than us, you have different customs, you have different ways, you were different than us. That was the beginning of them becoming a nation because you have to realize up until this point, they were a family that just grew, right? I knew these guys years ago, these guys were Egyptian, and they told me a story about a town that their like great, great, great grandfather went through, and he had like a bunch of wives, and they had children, and then the, one of his brothers came, and they, he had wives, had children. The point is, they, they have a town in Egypt that's populated by like, you know, a few thousand people, you know, whatever, and all of them are like, you know, first and second cousins, right? So, this is on as well. They're they're a family that grew, you know, four wives, twelve kids, you know, mostly boys, right? So you're gonna you're gonna produce, right? And so and so the 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 idea is to say that those people were going through a transformational process to become a nation. So what we see 
as tyranny, as slavery, as this understanding that you are different and you are the minority and you are not in a position of power and you are subjected to our will, this was the building process for them to understand that they were distinctly different than the rest of the nations, right? This process, this was the process, right? You hear me? The process is that this process is a dynamic of being separate and becoming who you are through pain and difficulty. Like most people think that we become who we are when we're on the stage and everyone's clapping for us or we win an award and, and, and we give a speech, whatever it is, everyone sees that. But they don't realize that Hashem is showing us in his Torah that in many times the building process of you becoming who you are comes to, as they say in sports, blood, sweat, and tears, right? It comes to that process of blood, sweat, and tears, and it's difficult, and, 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 and you don't understand why it's happening, and you're the chosen people, and you play a role, and you were told that your ancestry and your descendants are going to bring the redemption for humanity, but what, yet you're going through something this terrible, this difficult? This is Am Israel. So I just, you know, Moshe's mother, this is Am Israel, and this is also us in our lives. Every person is supposed to achieve greatness. That's the thing. Everyone's supposed to achieve greatness. That's the reason why we were born. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, uh, you know, Hasidic, Litvak, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. At our own individual level, we're all supposed to achieve greatness. And greatness is becoming one with the creator at our level in this lifetime. And everyone has different capacities. But that capacity, although it could be relatively look higher than in my capacity, if I had that capacity, it wouldn't work perfectly with the needs of my soul. So there's no competition between anyone. No one can outdo anyone because everyone has a, a special role, right? Everyone has a, a unique responsibility in this world. I'm great. And God gives us specific coordinates and conditions to go through a process to become great. And so sometimes that process starts with difficulty. Sometimes that process starts with negativity. Sometimes that process starts with rejection. Sometimes that process, God forbid, starts with abuse. Whatever it is that process is in our life, whatever way we started with, that was the building block of becoming who we were supposed to be become. This isn't my idea. This isn't Rabbi Mordecai's idea. This is in our Torah. Am Israel starts inside of Mitzrayim after the death of, of, of Yaakov. And that process of negativity and treated as a separate and the new Pharaoh rising and that Pharaoh not knowing Yosef and that whole process of, of, of that dynamic happening and the, the negativity and the angels and the whole dynamic that was going on there because the Jewish people fell off in their observance of their relationship. Because they fell off, Hashem brought this judgment to refine them and to bring them back into the fold. So that, that allows us to understand the process of coming in to, to, to Mitzrayim and meaning the dynamic of the, the birth of Moshe, where Moshe comes from, the process with Moshe, and everything that goes on. So Moshe grows up inside this palace. And, and, and this is one of my you know, favorite parts about this idea. Can't take full credit for it. But it's about the story of when Moshe fights the Egyptian. I'm going to expand off of it. So I can't fully give it credit to his original source. But the, the, the point is the same. So Moshe, as we know, Moshe, like all of us, right? Moshe grows up in this reality. A lot of things are given to him. A lot of things are, are placed to him. He, he's separate. You know, he grew up with a mother who had to, in many ways, abandon him. He grew up separate from his father and his family, although there, you know, there's midrashim that says there were certain interactions, you know, breastfeeding, things like this. But the point is just saying that Moshe grew up isolated. He grew up in a reality that he lived in, but he never felt was really him. 
he had abilities and talents that the environment necessarily did not provide a place for him to express the holiness of his soul and these things. So he, he was in a perplexed situation. And so the Torah tells us that Moshe, that Moshe, you know, goes out of the kingdom that raised him. That's not really his, but it's the only place that he really knows. And he goes out and he sees his brothers. He sees the, the Israelites. He sees the Israel. He sees the Jews. They're out there and they're slaving and they're in a very bad situation. They're difficult. They're being treated negative. And he's in this perplexed situation. He's like trying to figure out like, wait, what's going on? Like, why am I in these royal clothes? But these people who are my kin, who are my brothers, who I just feel an affinity just by looking at, why are they, why are they going through such hardship? But why am I living in a place that I'm totally disconnected to it? So he's having this conflict. He's having this huge conflict. He's going back and forth within himself. This is going on for a long time. And so the Torah says one day he goes outside of his house and he sees an Egyptian fighting a Jew. And he goes and he and he goes and the Torah says he wipes the 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 the, the, non, the, the Egyptian out. But the Torah says something specific that he looked inside of him and he, was, he wasn't able to see any holiness within him. And that look, the depth of that look, the man just dropped. Right? That's a whole nother point. But the point is the saying that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw the Egyptian fighting, fighting the, 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 the Jew, when he saw that fight, he saw himself. He saw him, you know, there's a famous Asatma Rebbe Ravi Yoel. I heard it said in his name that when, you know, when we're on Pesach and we have the, the, the different sons, right? The different sons. You know, we have the smart son, we have the wise son, you know, we did the, the whole thing, right? He says all those sons are the same people. They're just different characteristics of the same person. And they all come out at different times. And so we want to fix all of those different sons that are inside of us on the night of Pesach. So the point is just saying that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw the Egyptian and the, in the, in the Jew fighting, he saw himself. That was his inner conflict. And so when he goes and he wipes out the Egyptian, he, he was wiping out the Egyptian part of himself. The part of himself that was connected to materialism, the part of himself that did not feel like he had any social responsibilities, the part of himself that enjoyed the, the cuisines and the knowledge of the non-Israel uh, world, the non-Jewish world, all those aspects of himself, he buried that part of himself, and that's how he was able to go and begin his journey of becoming Moshe Rabbeinu, because he killed and he buried that part of himself. He killed and he buried that part of himself. And, 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 and as he's on his journey, you know, Rabbi Hirsch says something very interesting about Moshe Rabbeinu's name, right? He says Moshe Rabbeinu's name was given to him by, you know, uh, uh, by Batya, Peril's daughter. And the name Moshe means to draw out, right? That's what the name Moshe means to draw out. And he said the reason why Potiphar, not Potiphar, why, why Batya, right, gave Moshe that name because she wanted Moshe to know that she was the one who drew him out of the Nile and that he would always have in his mind this kind of like sense of like, oh, well, you know what, I, I'm in denture, she saved me, I owe her this, you know, this thing. That's what the name Moshe was given to him for. But Rabbi Her said, no, that name shaped his character. And that name shaped his character to the point that anytime he saw someone in distress, he wanted to draw them out. To the point later, later in the in a partial, it talks about it talks about it talks about Mount Sinai, right? And it talks about this idea of Mount Torah, right? And they said that when when Moshe was on Har Sinai, that you know, Hashem told him that the Jewish people were sinning, and he was going to wipe them out and start a nation with them. And, and Rabbi Hurst says that Moshe says, oh, you know what? If you, if you take out the, if you remove the Jewish people, take my name out of your book. 
take my name out of your book. I'm paraphrasing. Take my name out of your book. Rabbi Hirsch says, he says that because he's saying that I am Moshe. My existence is to draw the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim. That's what my job is, is to remove them out of Mitzrayim. So if you remove them, I don't exist. So this was Moshe's character. So as Moshe leaves, the story tells us that he goes, and I'm going in. I'm going in the. I'm going in the more um, going from a frame of of Derisa right now, and I'm skipping over a lot of Mishnayot that talk about the different things that Moshe did, and I'm going to the time of Midian, and the time of when Moshe sees, you know, this dynamic of 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 Sephora, right, and this meeting of him and his soulmate is huge, and this huge magical moment. But one of the things that's powerful about this magical moment, I remember, you know, years ago that the I remember years ago, I remember I went to this fam this family's house, and this was before I converted to Judaism. And this family knew like, you know, I really didn't have a place to go or what whatnot. And and uh, and they invited me over. Really nice, really nice Persian family, you know, in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, they invited me over. And I remember going there to uh, celebrate uh, Rosh Hashanah. And I remember seeing the father at shul, like doing the intermediary days. And I remember seeing the father and the father came up to me and said, hey, my daughter got engaged. My daughter got engaged. We're gonna have a big suda. Um, you know, um, um, could you, you know, you wanna come by? Right, type of a thing, right? People, you know, some people say it's not so good to get engaged this time. But regardless, the point is like this. He did something good, and I connected that good thing that he did for me as something that his daughter was rewarded, right? And so it's kind of a similar thing. The Torah tells us about uh, a Yethro. And Yethro's story is something that I always connected to throughout my whole spiritual journey because the Midrashim talk about how Yethro was, you know, the, 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 the master priest of idol worshiping and, and, and he went through all the different types of Avadazaras, right? And, you know, when I think about my path to Judaism, a lot of it is like I, I went through a lot of those paths too. And when I think of Avadazara, I think about paths that don't lead to the Rukhniyas of Hashem, but are told that you're going to be fulfilled from it, right? This is this is the Vadazar the way I understand it. And so, you know, I worked in, you know, I lived in, you know, the suburbs and I had really nice things, and that really didn't do it for me. Then I I, I left, I dabbled in education, you know, tried to go to college for a period of while. When I was there, it didn't work for me. Then I went and worked in a, in a, the private sector, had a lot of success, a lot of great experiences, but that really just didn't do it for me. Then, you know, I I, I got into politics. That really didn't do it. Then, you know, I converted. I converted actually before I got into politics. A lot of these things. What did it for me was when I was able to refine that understanding of myself with Hashem and be able to connect my soul to God's Ratzon. To God's will in this world, connecting my soul. Uh, obviously, there's more and more levels to it. We should all climb higher for the rest of our life. But the point is the same. When I was able to do that, that's when the shift happened for me. And a lot of it came when I came to Israel. A lot of it came in yeshiva and these types of things. But you have to go through all these false paths in life to get to where you're supposed to go. A lot of false paths. And that's, and that's, what, the, what, that's what the dynamic of Yethro teaches us is this dynamic of false paths that we may be learned from people in our environment, from information that we received, information that maybe we came up with ourselves, whatever, but these are these false paths that we have. And there's so much to talk about this, but so much else to talk about, right? We're talking about most Rabina, but going into this depth of false paths and these dreams and these ideas that are given to us. So the point is like this, is to say that Yethro rejected, rejected Avadazara. And he was the main priest of Avadazara, and his family, and his family was being abused. 
They were treated, they were ostracized, they were exiled, no one would talk to them, everything. That's what the whole dynamic of the shepherds and Moshe having to come in and defend because they were, they were giving them a hard time because these people became the outcasts because they were standing for truth. They were standing for Hashem and no one was there. There was no Moshe Rabbeinu there. Let's understand the letter of Yethro. Let's understand why potentially now we can maybe start to imagine why he has a whole parsha named after him. No one was there. There was no Moshe Rabbeinu. And he came to the conclusion on his own that God is one. And there's no dualities. And it's not physical. And it's from a source. He understood that himself and rejected all the Avada Zara with no one there supporting him. Let's think about how high that is. What type of DNA must have existed inside of Yethro in order to have the koach to do such a thing? Right? You, you see people, Abba Zara, this, whatever, blah, blah. They don't even know why they're doing it. They're just doing it because a lot of other people are doing it. And now we hear a story about a person who rejected it in his own neighborhood, in his own dynamic. Now let's think about that because this is a difficult part right now. It's difficult to have courage because the problem with having courage is that you believe that you're going to lose or there's a chance that you're going to lose so why do it keep what you have don't gamble more but when it comes to truth you only have one lifetime and if you're going to have a lifetime you're going to have a lifetime of truth or you're going to have a lifetime of just just, 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 just removing your independence and removing what makes you unique in the world. And you're gonna repeat, you're gonna remove that just to fit into an unfulfilling reality. You will always be fulfilled pursuing truth, no matter what you have materialistically, but you will always feel empty, no matter what you have materialistically, if you bittle your uniqueness and your inner truth. There's no way to win. And that, and that small little energy that a person can get from being accepted and being, being part of the team of everybody compares to nothing to the self-respect and the pride that a person has for keeping the truth. It can't compare. They asked a question about Noah. Noah, the great Sadiq. Sadiq Gamora saved the whole world. You know what they said? What made, what made Noah great? Most people would say building the ark, saving the world, of course. There's sources that teach us that what made Noah great was the fact that he never gave up, even though people made fun of him for over 100 years. Every day he was building the ark, and people would say, Look at this guy, look how crazy he is. What is he doing? This guy is a weirdo. Look at him. Ha, what a loser. And he stayed focused and he ignored all that. And by doing that, he was able to save the world. Yethro, by rejecting and being able to have the same strength in his generation that Noah, Noah displayed in his, Noah, uh, Noah displayed in, in his, his generation was the very mechanism that saved Am Israel. How? Because Sipporah is the one who did the bris milah, who saved Moshe Rabbeinu. And she had this ability to ignite inner chokmah that was not even taught to her before to be able to save her husband. This is, this is Sipporah. This is from Yethro. Where did Yethro get this wisdom to reject all of Adazara? There's something about this family. And so the point is it's saying that this lady Sipporah became the 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 malchus, the the machum kedusha for the whole world by being Moshe Rabbeinu's wife. This is that. This is that. This is the greatness of the potential of human beings. 
But we're so scared to live our truth. We're so scared to let go. We're so scared to live with the life that Hashem wants us to live. We're so scared. We're so scared of losing. We're so scared of failure. We're so scared of not taking a chance. We're so scared of what people are going to think. We're so scared of not fitting in that we're not even living our destiny. Think about the fact that Yethro rejected Avada Zara, and because his family was put in harem and separated from everybody in the community was the very thing that allowed a man by the name of Moshe Rabbeinu to be able to see that conflict and trigger within him his innate desire and connection to rescue the people who are in distress because that's how he came into reality through the frame of, ba of, of, of Batya, came into the frame of, 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 of Jochevet and, and Amram. These, these dynamics, all these elements that built Moshe Rabbeinu allowed him to be that perfect person at that perfect moment to be able to see that situation and respond and change and put Yethro in the history books forever. For the Holy Torah, he's made a place inside of the Holy Torah forever because he stood up for truth, nothing to do with Israelites, nothing to do with Am Israel, nothing to do with battling the Pharaoh or, or, or this or, or, or anything else. No, just a stom person, a stom person looking for truth. This is inside of everyone. And he meets Moshe Rabbeinu, the person who's supposed to bring truth to the whole world. He rejected falsehood. He got access to all the truth of the world. Just understand what's going on here. And so we'll end out, we'll go on this element. When there's something interesting, Yaakov and Yosef, I mean, sorry, Yaakov and Yosef, Yaakov and Moshe have a lot in common, according to the Holy Sages. The Holy Sages says that, that Yaakov represents this aspect of Teferit. This aspect of Teferit. So his father Abraham was Hesed. His 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 his, his grandfather Abraham was Hesed. His, his his father was Yitzhak, who was Gevorah. Hesed is the dynamic of the energy force of sharing. Gevorah is this dynamic of limitation, and Teferit is a central column of both. That's what it is. The central column of both. And this is what Yaakov was. Yaakov was the completion, hence him being the progenitor of Am Israel. But they say Moshe, who comes generations later, is also in the frame of Teferit. He's also was connecting that Teferit, but he was connected to this aspect of Teferit. He was connected to this aspect of Teferit, but a higher aspect of it. Because what they're in a the frame of is this aspect of Zair and Pin. And if you don't know it, just flow, just flow. They're in this aspect of Zair and Pin, which is the six pharaohs, from Hesed to Yesod, the six pharaohs, right? And so that frame was Zair and Pin. In each level of Zair and Pin, there's 10, right? There's 10 levels. So Hesed of Zair and Pin, there's 10. There's Keter to Machut. And the same thing as it goes all the way down. To the, the to, to, to the six, which is your soul. So in the frame of Teferit is, is Yaakov Avinu. And so generation later, as we learn other people that Hashem has chosen also plug in to these energy spheres. And Moshe connects to the element of Teferit as well, but he connects to the level of Teferit of Dot as where Yaakov connects the level of Teferit of Teferit. It's a whole system. The one that people understand, the people who know this will understand what I'm saying, but this is all from the Zohar. But the thing that's interesting and what we could take away from this is that Yaakov and Moshe both met their soulmates by a well. And if you look at the lotion specifically, you can see the difference in how it was described over here versus how it was described over there. And you can understand from there that 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 Yaakov represents the outer aspect of Teferit, and 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 Moshe represents the inner aspect, which is Dada of Teferit. We we could get that, but the point is the same that the, the Torah tells us, the sages tell us that he was able when Moshe went to saw the well, and he saw the well come out. 
the water rushed up towards him. In the same way that the water rushed up towards Jacob, he knew that he was going to meet a soulmate. He knew that he was going to meet a soulmate. Why? Because that's how his grandfather, or not his grandfather, his, 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 his ancestor did. And so there's a mechanism that happened over there is going to happen over here. And so Jacob had this experience over there. So Moshe decided it's going to work for me over here. So how does this connect? When we look at the lineage of our sages, when we look at who we are, when we look at what we're about, and we look at what we're supposed to do in this world, when you're looking from that aspect, you should have no fear about where your future is going to go. You should have no concern about your Yeshua, whatever it is, whether it's having a child, whether it's making pranasa, whether it's, you know, being successful in your learning yeshiva, whether it's, you know, making the right relationships, whether it's meeting the right person, whatever it is, you should have complete faith because in the same way that Hashem delivered the matriarchs and the patriarchs, he's going to deliver us as well. And we continue to grow and have success. Baruch Adonai Le'olam Amen Ve'Amen